Hey Church family, um, Shalom once again in the precious name of our Lord and Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to Calvary Chapel East Dulwich. Um, if you've been journeying with us for a little while now, you know that we're going through the book of Romans. We're in chapter 12 and we spent the last couple of weeks um, looking at the first um, two or three verses. And so we're going to continue along in chapter 12 today. But before we do that, let's lift up a word of prayer. Let's pray for the, the Lord's blessing upon this time we have together. So let's do that in Jesus name. Father. Once again, we're ever so grateful, Lord, that we can even come together in this capacity, Lord, to, to look at your word, to study together, to study to show ourselves approved, work men, work women who need not be ashamed, being able to rightly divide the word of truth. And so, Lord Jesus, we pray that by your spirit, you would be with us, minister to our hearts. Lord, we know that your word is profitable for all things. So bring conviction, bring comfort bring care, bring an element of love to us today. Wherever we're at right now, Lord, bring your word, bring your Holy Spirit, Lord, just to meet us at the point of our needs, Lord, so that we could be more like you, that you would be lifted up and you would be glorified. And we pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, as I said before, we have been going through the book of Romans and we are now in chapter 12. And as I've been saying over the last couple of weeks, in chapter 12, it's like where the, the Apostle Paul shifts gears and he begins to outline um, the application of the letter um, to the church or churches in Rome. And so <clears throat> we have had we've had eight chapters of doctrine and then we've had two or three chapters where it's been specifically addressed to Israel and their role in their position in the future. Um, and then, you know, Paul now gives us you know, um, these next chapters of, of application. It's the so what. It's like now that we have these doctrinal positions, we know why we've been saved, how we've been saved. What does that mean to me living in 2021? What does that now live, mean to me living through this thing, this pandemic we're going through called coronavirus? And so I've been using verses one and two as the springboard to push us into this application of of um, of the book of Romans, and so bouncing back, going back to verses one, two, and three today, Paul says, "I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies (plural) of God, that you present your bodies (that means your spirit, soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions, and your bodies) a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which he says is your reasonable service." And he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So the whole process starts with how we think, because how we think will determine how we act. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone, to everyone, to everyone, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself or herself more highly than he or she ought to think, but to think soberly, to therefore be humble, as God has dealt to each one um, a measure of grace. And so God has dealt to, to each one of us. He's given us a measure of faith. And we, we, we saw last week that Paul links the measure of faith with gifting, which interestingly is the word for gifting is charisma. So I thought that's quite interesting, you know, because, you know, we, we've all got a, an element of charisma. So anyway, for as we, verse 4, have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So I cannot do what you do and you cannot do what I do. I may be able to do what you do, and you not, may not be able to do what I do. So we need each other. That's basically what Paul's trying to say. We need each other, and we need to demonstrate the giftings which God has given to us. He's given each one a measure of faith, okay? So we, being many, are one body in Christ, because Christ is not divided, right? And individually, members of one another. Again, I need you, you need me, we need each other. Verse 6, having then gifts... So it's standard, standard that we all have gifts. Some may have more gifts than others, but we all 
have gifts. We all have a measure of faith. Having gifts now, differing according to the grace, God's unmerited favor, God's, God's favor that is given to us. So it's God who's given us the gifts, the grace, okay? Let us use them. So there is an expectation of the Godhead um, that we will use the gifts which God has given to us. And if we are not using the gifting and we are not functioning in the capacity which God himself has given us those giftings, then what is happening, it happening is that we are doing a disservice to God and we are doing a disservice to the body. And I say that because in First Corinthians, no, I think it's first, first Corinthians. First Corinthians, it says that the eye cannot say to the hand, guess what? I have no need for you. So we all need each other. And if one part is not is not fulfilling its function, then it affects the whole. And so by serving God and by serving the body while we are in the body is an important factor in our Christian walk. And it doesn't alter our position before God. It's not, it doesn't alter our position in the sense that are we now saved? Are we not saved if we don't use our gift and we're not functioning for God? No, because it's not a matter of salvation. It is a matter of how effective we are in the master's hands. Once he's taken us out of darkness into his marvelous and glorious light, how effective are we now in the master's house hands? You know, and so, you know, we want to be vessels unto honor, vessels which the master can use for his goodness and for his glory. And so some may be saying, well, you know, I don't really mind whether I'm being used by God as long as I get through those pearly gates. I don't care whether I'm going to be given such a great reward when he says, well done, thy good and faithful servant. And it's like, because I just want to get into heaven. I don't want to go to hell, you know, which is one attitude fair but it's the wrong mindset it's the wrong attitude which you are to have if you are a believer in Christ Jesus because God has created you for so much more he has gifted you for so much more so just to just to get by just to get by is, is not God's expectation from you. And basically, if you do have that mindset, it actually shows that a, a, an internal problem of the heart and of the mind. And so we need to find out first and foremost what our gifting, gifting is or what our giftings are. And once we find out what they are, or what it is, we need to use them. And so from here... Paul lists areas of gifting, like a grocery store, like a shopping list in a sense, and the expectation is for the believer to live in this way. And so, as we go through this list of list of you know different duties, my hope really is that for you and I, the Holy Spirit now will convict us to see well, where we're measuring up in this how we will outwork in this within our own lives, okay? So we'll, that's as we go further on. But initially, he lists areas of, of giftings. And usually within the New Testament, we have three categories of gifts or giftings listed within the New, New, New Testament. We have sign gifts, we have speaking gifts, and we have serving gifts. And these gifts, gifts are listed in 1 Corinthians chapters 12 through to 14 so 12 12 13 and 14 and and, and 13 is is put right in the middle there because basically Paul says look if you don't have love these giftings mean absolutely nothing because it has to be coming from a motivation of love Okay, and that's why we have First Corinthians 15 there, because Paul says, I'm going to show you a, a more excellent way, if you can remember what the text says at, at the end of, of chapter 12. So we have it in First Corinthians 12, First Corinthians 13, and First Corinthians 14. Then we have it in First Peter chapter 4, verses 10 to 11. We have the gifts of the body in Ephesians um, 4, and we have it here in Romans chapter 
to 12. These are the, these are the areas in the New Testament where you will find gifts, giftings to the body. Okay, And so Paul starts off in, in verse 6. He says, if prophecy, Romans 12 verse 6, if prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching. He who exalts in exhortation. He who gives with libera liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So let's pause there for a moment. So obviously, I want to try and tackle the rest of the chapter for today, and I can't go into depth into all the things which Paul lists. Listen, and usually we'll see that he's he's bunching them up in in in. Well, we'll get there in a minute. Let's go back to if prophecy let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. So prophecy, which is very very interesting because it is the word prophetia in the Greek, which primarily means to speak publicly. So prophecy, when we think about it, doesn't have to have this mystical element to it. And it is publicly declaring the word of God. And within this, we have prophecy as foretelling. Um, um, it's foretelling that which has already been established as scripture. And we have foretelling, which is predicting what will happen in the future it's prophesying what will take place in the future and generally as the church you know i would say that we get impressed with the whole foretelling aspect of prophecy predicting the future and we get impressed when people say thus saith the lord because you feel like wow you've just heard from god and and when people say the, the lord will have me say to you my friend you know we kind of like we, look, we, we, we get caught up within those scenarios and we, we get impressed because we feel like, oh, this is a man of God. And it's like they've heard directly from the Lord. And, you know, we, we get impressed because, as I said, we feel like they've directly heard from the Lord, that obviously there must be power, there must be a bit of way in which this person is saying and everything. And so we get impressed. And, you know, it's a bit like, we feel like we get more power when we're praying and we start shouting and we start sort of like, you know, really shouting into the heavenlies and everything. And like thinking like those in the in, in, in the spiritual realm sort of like have hearing problems or something and they can't hear what we're saying. You know, God knows what we have need of even before, even before we even said it. He knows our thoughts from afar off and everything. But we somehow feel like we need to start shouting. Nothing wrong with shouting, I suppose. But it doesn't give us more power because we shout in prayer, you know. It, you know, it, we, we feel like we've been prayer as well. And I'm getting off on a little tangent now, but I'm just trying to say the things which make us feel like we have more power, but really, is it scriptural? You know, um, you know, we, we often can sort of like rebuke and command, you know, demons and everything. And I don't personally think that's scriptural. Even within the book of Jude, we see how M Michael contending over the body of Moses with Satan says, the Lord rebuke you. So Michael, big, massive, powerful angel, doesn't rebuke, doesn't rebuke Satan. He says the Lord rebuke you. So I'm just saying these things that that just like with prophecy, we get impressed in prayer. We feel like if we do this, it's more impressive and it's more power, you know. But I would argue that you know that's just a, 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 a something within our nature which we feel like makes us feel more effective and as we we go through the scriptures back sort of like relating it to prophecy now as we go through the pages of scripture scripture we see that the main emphasis of prophecy in particular is to reinforce what has already been established which has already been written within the pages of scripture so for a few examples we see that daniel for example he proclaimed and he reiterated what had already been established and written by the prophet jeremiah and this is why daniel when he's in when he's in babylon and they're, they're in captivity in babylon he could see that oh we're, we're going to be here for 70 years well how do you know you're going to be here for 70 years uh, daniel it's written in the book of jeremiah jeremiah 29 10 this is why, just another example, John the Baptist. John the Baptist came along and he publicly 
proclaimed and reiterated the words of who? The prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. You see, Isaiah said that, and so John the Baptist comes along and he reiterates what, John, what, uh, what Isaiah said. We know as we look at the New Testament, Paul proclaimed many of the words of Isaiah in his letters. And so foretelling is the usual use of prophecy within the scriptures. And it tells us that he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. Because you're expounding what's already been written, you're expounding what God's word has already said. But obviously, even within that, even though I would say that's the main use of the word of, of prophecy within scriptures, we still have a place for forth telling. Obviously, you know, a large portion of the Bible is prophecy, prophet, prophetic sayings. OK, and it, so it still has a place. And that's why when we look at Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Jonah, Haggai, Zechariah, you know, when they spoke and they said the word of the Lord came to me and they prophesied, they're prophesying about future events. So there still has a place there. Like when Jesus, he prophesied about the destruction of the, of the temple and the destruction of Jerusalem. And he prophesied that 40 years before it actually happened. We have Micah 5, you know, Micah 5 prophesied, you know, Micah prophesies about where Messiah would be born. We know it was in Bethlehem. Again, back to Isaiah. Isaiah prophesied and he spoke about how Messiah would die. And then we have like, I'm throwing some out there. We have Joel, who, you know, who, who speaks of events of the last days. And then Peter, once they come out and they, they, the Holy Spirit has been poured out and they come out of the upper room. Do you know what I mean? He says, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And he starts reiterating the prophecy of Joel, see? And so, so many examples throughout the scriptures. And so I personally believe that prophet, prophecy today is still primarily the proclaiming of the established word of God through the teaching of the word. It's bigging up Jesus and it's bigging up Jesus because Revelation chapter 19 verse 10 says, Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So it's bigging up Jesus. We big up Jesus. It's like we're prophesying. It's like we're, de we're declaring his word. And so we are to use prophecy in its right context. We should not despise prophecy because First Thessalonians says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test all things, hold fast to what is good. Test all things. Hold fast away. So if somebody comes along and says, oh, the Lord's given me a word for you, like, cool. That's all right. If the Lord's given me a word, for you, you've given you a word for me, I now need to test that. I need to, I need to line that up with the word of God. That's what I need to do. That's what we all need to do. When we hear words going out there, we need to line it up with the word of God to see if those things are actually true. And if they're not true, woo, Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18 gives us a standard. God has given us his own standard. The prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. Shall die. That's what God's standard is. Even if you speak a presumptuous thing, you shall die. And so the, the standard God says, everything you say, if you're saying you're my prophet, has to come to pass. If you fail in one, you're a false prophet. And especially over the last couple of months and everything, there's so many people prophesying about, you know, presidential elections in America, or whether it be sort of like what, what the coronavirus is and everything. And you know what? You've got to be careful what you're listening to. It has to line up with God's word. And these people prophesied and they were all wrong. What? Well, I'm just saying, if they were sincerely wrong, they apologised, they apologised. But if it was the Old Testament, they should have got stoned because that's what the scripture says. And so we have to be careful not to just use, thus saith the Lord, or, or I've got a word for you, my friend, lightly, because God doesn't take that lightly. I'm just saying these things because that is Bible. So let us be careful with this predicting stuff because God will not play with false prophecies and with false prophets. So let us prophesy, Paul goes on to say, that is speak God's word, preach God's word, 
teach God's word in proportion to our faith. So in proportion to how we are led by God to use this gifting of prophecy and in proportion to what is consistent with our faith, with our doctrine. So again, now we circle back to the first eight or 11 chapters of Romans to know what our doctrine is. When we prophesy, whatever we're speaking needs to line up with what God's word says. And so we are not to teach something that is dodgy to our faith, what is not in line with the doctrine we believe in. So, you know, again, put it out there. There's so many doctrines out there which we would say we don't believe in, which does not line up with our faith. And I could just throw out there, you know, we have the prosperity movement and we have the majority of the teachings of the charismatic movement, which do not line up with the doctrine of our faith. And obviously we have other groups out there like the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons or the Seventh-day Adventists. And these things, I would say, are not in proportion to the doctrine of our faith. And so Paul says, let us prophesy in proportion to, to our faith, the faith and the doctrine which has been declared to us. So prophecy is important. Speaking the word of God is important, but it has to line up with what God has already established, what God has already written. Now, I've spent a lot of time there because I think it's important. Um, because, you know, again, if you if you go on to, I'm digressing again, but if you go onto YouTube and you look at a lot of these people who have made false prophecies and you look at how many subscribers and how many views they have, they're in the, they're in the thousands, the hundreds of thousands. So that's hundreds of thousands of people who are taking in this false information, these false prophecies and being led astray. And that's how important it is. And that's the reason why I really just kind of like just jumped on that. And so we're moving on now. Verse seven, all ministry, diakonia, a diakonia, that's about diakonia, which is to, to serve. So if you happen to be someone who loves to serve, then basically give yourself over to serving and to serving the body of Christ. That's what the scripture, that's what Paul is saying. So let us use it in ministering. If you love to serve, then use it for the gift of the body, for the benefit of the body. He who teaches, he who teaches in teaching. So the difference between, which could be, if you're asking this, the difference between somebody who's prophesying. If prophesying is just declaring what has already been established with the word of God, then what's the difference between prophesying and the difference between teaching? Well, the difference between teaching is that it's, it's seen in the sense that the prophet comes and, and, and proclaims the word or preaches the word of God, whereas the teacher is seen as someone who has actually gone through a process of, of study and has gone through the process of training and perhaps more of a systematic form of training and therefore is able to teach people from point A to, to point Z, Z, Z. You get what I'm saying? So the teacher now carries the congregation along a process of teaching them the word of God, where the prophet, in a sense, could kind of like roll up into town and says, the word of God, da 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 and he's back out of town, in a sense. Not completely, but in a sense, if you see what I mean. So, again, if you believe you have been blessed with a teaching gift, then you need to use it. You need to use it for the benefit of the body, you know. But then equally knowing that the balance to that is that James says, my brethren, that not many of you become teachers knowing that you or me, we shall receive a stricter judgment. And so... Teaching, and that is why we here at Calvary Chapel East Dulwich, you know, we like to give people the opportunity, we like to give people within our fellowship the opportunity to take turns in sharing things like communion, men sharing at men's breakfast, and women sharing within women's groups, and so on and so forth, because this gives us an opportunity uh, for people to teach, and it acts as an indicator to see, okay, well, this person has a teaching gift. Or this person, you know what, they don't have a teaching gift. And I think that's an equally valid thing to say as well. 
this person has a teaching gift and it's obvious that person loves the Lord and everything, but that necessarily a teaching gift. Not to say that they cannot teach their, if they have children or a sibling or neighbours or friends. Obviously, because we're all meant to be able to teach the word in that sense, but actually teaching the word and carrying people from like a point A to B or point A to Z, you know, you know, we like to, you know, ex give people the exposure to see if they have that gift. Okay, because it's important to 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 give them that exposure to the body, and so the teaching gift. Carrying on, he who exalts in exhortation. So those who love to genuinely boost up others. That's the way I like to sort of like say it. it's like someone who you come alongside and you're like, oh, you're so good. And it's like you know you do so much and. You're really gifted, and, and they say it genuinely, and they say it sincerely because that's how they feel about you. And they're just someone who is just—it's just a joy to be around. Maybe because they're making you feel good, I don't know. But you know, someone just that naturally they just and an encourager. I mean, Barnabas was obviously just an encourager. Do you know what I mean? And so it's someone who comes alongside, and they're part of their gift to the body because they they know how to encourage and they know how to exalt others and help others feel good about themselves and help to sort of like, you know, help people to just kind of like keep moving forward within the faith. He who gives with liberality, liberality, sorry, I keep saying that word wrong, liberality. <laughs> so this is, a, this is giving of oneself in all areas, you know, giving of oneself, giving of one's time, of one's resources, you know, it can be financially, you know, if the Lord has blessed you with wealth, it can be given financially, but it's giving of oneself in all areas of your life. You, you know, you're able to help there, you're able to help there, you're able to just give of yourself, you know. So he who gives, and you just do it liberally, you know, it's like, it's not like, oh, well, I've done my little quote now, it's like, you just, look, it's cool, I don't mind helping, you know. So he who leads, with diligence, I suppose this could be the bit of the, the the Indians and the Chiefs. You know, obviously there's people who are natural leaders, and they're just built to be leaders. And there are some who are not necessarily have that leadership quality. It's like, and they don't mind. You know, you lead and I'll follow. It doesn't matter. I just want some direction. Give me some direction and I'll follow that direction. But there's others who are like, no, you know what? I feel like the Lord has gifted me in that leadership capacity. And it's like, and look, Paul's saying, if you if you have that leadership quality, use it for the benefit of the body. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. And I love this because, you know, it's saying show mercy with a smile on your face. That's what it's basically saying. Show mercy with a smile on your face. You know, don't demonstrate mercy and then go talking about it, you know, and keep bringing it up every every five minutes. Or you remember when I showed you that act of mercy? Da -da 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 -da, because you didn't really, because it didn't come from a sincere place, you know. So show mercy with cheerfulness because you want to, you know. Show mercy with cheerfulness now from from verses 9 to 13 see they, they, the areas of giftings yeah what we just looked at so from verses 9 to 13 now the apostle paul is going to start looking at our actions within those giftings if i can say it that way it's our actions so we have our gifting and then our action actions that go with these giftings so i say all this this right if you can think about the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians, Paul says they had mad gifting. They had proper gifting. They had, you know, all the offices and everything, just people just praying in tongues and healings and dawn and it was all good. But they had horrible character, you know, they had horrible character. And so this is why Paul writes the letter, because it's a corrective letter to 1 Corinthians. And so we could have mad gifting, but we could have horrible character. And Paul said, no, don't, you know what, don't have mad gifting and horrible character. Have good character. And if the giftings outwork themselves through that, then praise the Lord. But God is more interested in your character than you sort of like thinking you're all that with your gifting. So God is looking at gifting and character and God's expectation of his children is that we'd use our gifting and we would appropriate his character 
his image, his likeness into our lives. That's God's expectation of all of us. It isn't like he saves us and says, okay, cool, just put your feet up and kick back now because obviously you're in the kingdom of God now. It's not, no, now that you are in the kingdom, I have an expectation of you. He has an expectation of me to now start working with him, working with the Holy Spirit and living like Christ. So he says, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honour giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distribute, uh, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. So some have looked at this and kind of like seen that Paul has kind of like grouped these, a lot of these things in threes, you know, and so maybe he has, maybe he hasn't, because remember the original didn't have chapter and verse divisions, and so it was just one, so I don't know, but you know, if you could take them in threes, it, maybe it's help, easier to remember them, I don't know, but, but well, let's just look at them anyway. Let love, let love be without hypocrisy. So let love, which is the word, you know, we've got these lots of different words for love in, in the Greek, right? But it's the word agape. Agape is unconditional love, which is based upon a choice. I choose to love you. It doesn't matter what you do. I just choose to love you. You know, it's when a, a husband and a wife, or when a couple come together to to exchange vows with each other in marriage, it's not based on a feeling. It's not because you're my brother or my sister. It's based on lower. I love you. I choose to love you and forsake all others. I choose to. And so, you know, we have, you know, the vows in sickness and health, for better for worse and everything. Within those scenarios, within those different situations which we can encounter through life, I choose to love you. It's agape love, unconditional love. So it's not based upon feelings. Jesus said that the world will know that you are my disciples by what? By the love, the unconditional love we have for one another. And so again, as we come into the kingdom of God, God expects of all the people which we as his children should be demonstrating love to should be our brothers and sisters in the faith. First and foremost, I mean, more than anybody else, we should be demonstrating love to the whole world, obviously. But standard, no-brainer to those of the household of faith. So, so let love, and again, love is an action. Love, you know, first, first Corinthians chapter thirteen tells us about love, you know, and all the different characteristics of love, and that's what I said earlier. That Paul says after he's listed all these giftings, he goes at the end of chapter twelve in First Corinthians. He says, "But I will show you a more excellent way. I will show you a more excellent way." And he gives us the love chapter. See, so so see he Paul's reiterating here: let love be without hypocrisy. Don't go on two face, basically, if I can say it in South London terms, you know. So don't go on like you love someone and really, you know, it's like you know, you, you know. I mean, there's a yes and a no to that because we are meant to put on Christ, but. Why have you, if you don't love someone, you have to be put on Christ because you really don't. Why have you got that ought in your heart? Why have you got a con that level of contempt for a brother or a sister in that way within your heart? If, you're, if you've been saved by grace, you shouldn't be thinking about or feeling about other people in that way. Standard. Let love be without hypocrisy. We shouldn't be hypocrites as born-again believers in Christ Jesus. Love needs to be genuine it needs to be come from, coming from a pure place christ has saved us and we need to be coming from a pure place and sincere place to to love each other as christ loved us and so let love be without hypocrisy you know god god the apostle paul's writing this and god's saying you know what this is my standard you know church this is my standard abhor what is evil now abhor means to detest to loathe to hate to despise despise those things what are evil 
what are evil and, and it's funny how within within the world today we live in this world which is increasingly becoming in my opinion more and more liberal and we are bombarded with the world calling what is evil good and what is good evil that's what we're being bombarded with now you know i mean these are silly examples but you know Michael Jackson used to go, I'm bad, I'm bad, you know, it's like, and so, it, <laughs> that's not a great example, but, you know, and we would turn around and say, we look at something which is really, really cool, and we say, that's sick, and it's like, sick isn't necessarily really good, is it? But we would use those terminology, not good examples, but examples nonetheless. I'm just trying to say that it says, abhor what is evil. So when we see evil in the world, our attitude towards evil, in whatever shape or form it is, should to be, should be, I abhor that. I detest that because I know that it's not of God. You know, that should be our attitude towards it. That should be our mindset towards what is evil. And, you know, as the world bombards what it wants to bombard us with, and get us to start having this different mindset which we need to transform ourselves, not to be conformed to the world, you know, we have to maintain this standard, let God be true, let God's word be true, and every man a lie. The world system, let it be a lie, because God's word is the standard of truth. So abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Now, cling to what is good is like, it's like being glued to, it's cleaving to, it's being joined to what is good. And you know, and we can only intrinsically know what is good by looking at God's word. God's word is the standard of truth. God's word is the standard of good. And as I said, I'm just going to repeat myself. As we look into the world, we cannot get our standard of good. We cannot get our standard of truth from the world. The only thing which is the same yesterday, today and forever is Christ Jesus Heaven and earth is going to pass away, but my word shall remain. The word of God is the only standard of truth which we can stand on. So, we continue. Clinging on to what is good, abhorring what is evil. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honour given preference to one another. So, again, it's this attitude that those of the household of faith, we need to be kind to be kind, I mean, to be kind is just something which, you know, we just take for granted these days. I've said it before, but just being kind, just being nice to people, we take it for granted. And when we, we see acts of kindness being demonstrated, we celebrate it because we see that that's the way things should be. You know, when Captain Sir Tom done his hundred laps of his of his garden, he raised money for the NHS. Everybody support, applauded it and some celebrated it and everything because it's like, it's something he did which was kind, he didn't have to. And you know, he raised so much money in the process, but acts of kindness, you know, it's, it's something which God says, look, again, should be the standard attitude and characteristic of those who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, Jesus is our Lord. Be kindly affectionate, be showing affection towards one another. And as I said, we as a society, I believe, have just lost track of, of being kind. And, and you know, it's we're, we're very much looking out for me, myself and I, as opposed to giving honour and preferring those who are among us. Giving preference to one another, you know. And so I see it as like, it's a characteristic of the Adamic nature, isn't it? That we want to look out and protect ourselves and look out for ourselves first and foremost. And then, you know, whoever comes along and gets a, gets a bringing, gets a bringing. But, but this is saying, no, be, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honour, giving preference to one another. That's what, that's the standard God is looking for. So we are to put on Christ and we are to show brotherly and sisterly love in that capacity not lagging so not being slowful not dragging our heels in diligence so if god has asked you to do something or you you know whether that's something spiritual or if that's something practical or something within the workplace or within the school your school life or whatever it may be if god has asked you to do don't lag <laughs> don't take your time dragging your heels and and being slowful in it be diligent with it 
because as we are diligent in doing what is being presented before us, guess what? We're, we're, we're reflecting a characteristic of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus wasn't lagging. Jesus didn't just sort of like, you know, he went from t village to village, town to town, city to city. He kept on moving, kept on moving within his ministry. And so he's just saying, look, be diligent. Be fervent in spirit. So be zealous for and sensitive to the spirit of God working in our lives. So being fervent in spirit, like I mentioned at the beginning of what well, the message today, isn't necessarily getting up in a hype and sort of like praying loud and sort of like demonstrating that, you know, you're so fervent. Just fervent in spirit is basically just being able to, to um, you know, sensitively just demonstrate that the spirit of God is working in your life. You know, so when when you start having off key thoughts and everything, you take it and you bring it on the subjection of Christ. When you know that you're acting in a particular way, you're like, Lord, forgive me because, you know, I know that this is not how you want me to act. So forgive me. I, I repent and help me to work in your opposite way fervent to know that you're, you're you're in tune with the spirit of god working in your life so that when he speaks to you in your innermost being you, you make your adjustments fervent in spirit nobody else doesn't need to know about it if they do fine but they don't necessarily need to know it's not this outward display of oh i'm showing everyone i'm fervent in spirit it's not that i don't believe it can be that but it's not that all the time so be fervent, serving the Lord. Again, serving the Lord because it's our reasonable service. Reasonable service as we present our bodies and live in sacrifice. It's our reasonable service unto him. Rejoicing in hope, verse 12. Um, rejoicing in hope. And the text should really say rejoicing in the hope. The definite article hope, which is the hope that Christ Jesus will return for us one day. And so it's referring to, in a sense, Titus 2.13, where it says the blessed hope, our blessed hope of Christ's return. Patient in tribulation. Ooh, patient in tribulation. Patient in flipsis. And I've spoken about flipsis before, which is pressure. You know, we are to be patient when we are under pressure, under tribulation, under potential persecution. Patient because, you know what? Let patience have its perfect work. And that's what God wants for us. Continually stead continuing steadfastly in prayer because prayer is always meat and potato. It's always staple diet. You cannot get away from prayer. My house should be called a house of pray prayer. Pray without ceasing. Praying always in the spirit. You know, praying all the time. Praying is just part of the staple diet if you are a Christian. You know, and pray, there's all different types of prayer. It can be in your closet. It can be corporate prayer. It can be as you're going down the road, going, you know, it could be while you're at a bus stop. You know, it can be very intentional and focused on one specific thing. You know, so, so many different aspects of prayer. So, you know, and there's nothing in the Bible that says that you have to sort of like close your eyes and kind of like put your hands together. There's nothing that says that it's not a bad thing. Praying is speaking to God. It's speaking to our Heavenly Father, the one who says that now you can come boldly before his throne and you can chat with him. You can call him Abba, Abba Father, Dear Father, Daddy, if you want to, and just know that you've got an audience with the one. Praying always. So, continually steadfast in prayer. Distributing to the needs of the saints. Given to hospitality. You know, showing hospitality in whichever way we are gifted and able to show hospitality. Now, from verse 14, um, it's in a sense, if I've just spoken about our actions, now it's going to start labelling our reactions, our reactions. And and a lot of these, again, are a bit like, ouch, oh, oh, really, Lord, is that how you want me to be? Is that how you want me to act? And it's like, yes, exactly. Because... These things which are going to list now are like the total opposite to what we want to do when somebody is mean to us or someone is horrible to us. Because our natural tendency when somebody's horrible is like, what? You're talking to me? You just want to let rip on someone. Somebody does something horrible to you, you want to do something horrible to them. And God's like, no, 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 no. That's not the attitude of my child. You know, 
if we are of the household of faith, we are to have the Holy Spirit again working in our hearts, working in our minds, and now helping us to look at God's word and say, all right, Lord, how would you want me to act, react in this situation? And, you know, the first thing which Paul lists here, like, is like what Jesus said in what we call the Beatitudes, um, Luke 6, you know, he says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. You see, the first thing he's listed here now, this section is like, bless those who persecute you. It's not a natural thing we want to do. We want to do the opposite. Why? Because we are to present our bodies unto God as living sacrifices and we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds and part of that process is to know all right cool that person's been horrible to you bless them bless them i don't want to yeah but if you're my child you need to bless those who persecute you bless and do not curse verse 15 rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep now we rejoice with those who rejoice. And we at here at Calvary Chapel East Village, we know over the last few months we've had, you know, um, our fair share of rejoicing and weeping over the past few months. You know, we've had praise reports and testimonies um, which have been wonderful. But alongside those things, we've had sad news and we've had bereavements. And we, we've been able to, to be, show sympathy and weep with those who weep. And in a sense, it's, it is the circle of what we know of life at the moment, isn't it? Where, you know, when, when lovely things happen, it's just not we, we celebrate that. But equally, when, when not so nice things happen, we, you know, we need to come alongside people and we need to show so genuine sympathy within those areas. So we rejoice with those who rejoice and we weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. So obviously we're not going to be able to think the same thoughts and exactly with one another but you know when within us thinking towards one another we're not sort of like i think the context is that don't show partiality to one person as opposed to another person usually people in position like i'm a pastor it's like people might want to show me more partiality than someone else and really i'm just the same as everybody else yeah i've got more responsibility because i teach and i have oversight and everything over over, over a flock but at the end of the day i'm the same as you and we should not be showing partiality to anyone you know james talks about if somebody with, with fine apparel and gold rings comes in and everything and you say oh yeah 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 it's sort of like take this front row seat and everything and then somebody else comes in who's not well to do and you want to sit at the back of the church no 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 as believers we're not meant to have that we're not meant to show partiality we're meant to treat each other on the same level on equal footing so have the same mind to one another do not set your mind on high things which is going back now to verse 3 of chapter 12 but associate with the humble do not be wise in your own opinion so again the attitude of humility needs to be you know a core attitude of the believer in Christ Jesus. Back to this, repay no one. Does that mean no one? That mean kind of just someone. No, repay no one evil for evil. No one means no one. Because, you know, within Christ Jesus, just that's just not our bag. It's just not our attitude we are to have if we say that we call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We repay no one evil for evil you know and paul's going to get into it uh, in verse 19 where he says because vengeance is not yours vengeance is the lord's so don't even bother going down that road there and when you start having wanting to repay e people evil for evil it just opens up a whole different kind of worms it just opens up opens you up to being hateful and and, and there's murderous thoughts and, and anger and, and it's just horrible so he's saying look don't even go there. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. So you know, don't have those evil thoughts. Have regard for good things in the sight of just some people. No, the sight of all people. So, so as well as those in the household of faith, we're meant to show you know good things in the sight of all people, people in the whole world. And that's what um, 
Philippians 4, which we, we generally quote a lot these days, you know, speaks about, it says, think about those things which are of good report, of good report. So in another way, be optimistic, be a glass half full person. Don't be miserable, especially when you're around people in the world because you are reflecting Christ. They're looking at you and thinking, oh, is this how a Christian goes on? Is this how a Christian acts? You see? So it's like, be optimistic. Think of those things which are a good report. If it is possible, but as much depends on you. So if it is possible, but as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. So basically, as much as it is in your power to live at peace with someone else, the command is live peaceably. As much as it is to do with you. Now, as somebody else who, because like you've got, a, it takes two to live at peace, right? If the other party decides they don't want to live at peace with you, then that's on them. But as much as it is possible for your position, Live peaceably with all men. Live in shalom with all men, with everyone. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to, to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will pay, says the Lord. So we, are, we, are, we have not been called to vengeance, as I said before. And the word wrath here, again, when I said it, that the word hope before was the definite article, the hope. This verse here is the definite article, article, the wrath, the wrath of the last days. So, so in the meantime, the in-between time, we have to trust God that he is righteous and that he is a just God and he will repay whatever needs to be paid on that day. He may repay it before that day, but ultimately on that day, God will settle up all accounts and everyone who needs to get whatever they need to get will get what they what will they get, you know? And we are not to live in this place, as I've said before, of wanting to see revenge, of vengeance, of repaying evil for evil because put yourself in that place. If God had that attitude to, 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 to you and to me, none of us would be saved, you know? God didn't pour out his vengeance upon us us he gave us the opportunity to come into relationship with him therefore he wants us to have that the attitude of of you know not repaying evil for evil you know but showing grace and showing mercy and that's why he goes on to say therefore if your enemy is hungry feed him if he is thirsty give him a drink for in doing so, you will reap coals or heap coals of fire on his head. And this is a quote from Proverbs chapter 25, verse 2. And exactly what this heaping of coals on the head actually means, now, I couldn't really find it. I've heard it, what it might be, but I, couldn't, I don't know exactly what that means. But the attitude is, if your enemy is hungry, feed them in it. If they need a drink, Give them a drink. Be nice, be kind. Don't repay evil for evil. Do not be overcome by evil, verse 21, but overcome evil with good. So we are to overcome evil with God because God expects us to use what he has given to us. He expects us to use what he has outlined in scripture as his, his nature and his character for the benefit of our, for ourselves because we want to be more and more like Christ, but for the benefit of the body. OK, and to be an overcome, overcomer. And so I know it's been long and we're, we're, we're really going to land the plane right now. But 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 in terms of being used by God, serving God, working for God, can I give us just a final thought? And the final thought is this. If you can think back to the Garden of Eden, Genesis, working for God was a completely fulfilling and pleasurable experience for Adam. There was harmony with God because, you know, Adam would do his work and God would come and jam with him in the cool of the day. But after the fall, working for God became, because God cursed uh, the earth, didn't he? And he says, it's by the sweat of your brow that you're going to work now. So work became a struggle because the earth was coarse and cursed and it would brought forth thorns and thistles. But 
through the cross, working for God now, should once again be that pleasurable experience. As we use the gift in which God has given to us in the first place for his glory. And so the encouragement family is that God has gifted you. God has called you. God wants to use you as a vessel of honour in his hand. God has given us everything we need for, for what, what, what pertains to godliness in his word through the new birth. And he wants us to use them. And so I hope that as we've been listening to the word today, that the Holy Spirit has been convicting us and has been challenging us in areas of our life where we're like, you know what, I'm really falling short in demonstrating love to my brother or my sister. I'm really falling short of being optimistic. I'm really falling short of using my gift, which I know God has given to me. I'm really falling short in da 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 You know what it is in my character, you know. God knows that he always wants to give this these mid-course corrections and he wants us to say, okay, well, if you know that you're falling short there, if there's something you need to repent of, repent of it and let's just move forward. That's what God wants us to do. And so I hope that we are encouraged. I hope that we're not condemned because God doesn't want to condemn anyone. But he wants us all to mature in relationship with him. And so we're finishing there. Next week, we're going to pick up in chapter 13 and we're going to then see our responsibility to the government. Yes, the government, you know, um, the government of the United Kingdom um, and just where we're at right today. So be blessed. Let's just pray. Let's see what the Lord. Um, and I pray that the Lord give you a great week. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for the blessings of the word. I know it was a lot we've got through today, but. You know, so many different areas, Lord, where I'm sure we were all challenged. By your spirit, Lord Jesus, um, bring conviction to our hearts. Bring us to that place, Lord, where we, 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 we surrender, we want to be more like you. And let the name of Jesus continue to be glorified in our lives. And we pray in Jesus' name and all of God's family said, Amen. Amen.